me on camera here and we'll go ahead. We're all get all set to record. Lowell, feel free to jump in. I'll get us started. It's so great to see you. And it looks like we've got about 33 folks, uh, 34 trickling in. And we're just going to go ahead and jump right in because we want to honor everybody's time. We have the next uh, very exciting 90 minutes with you. And Will and I are excited to jump in and get started. I want to go ahead and just first welcome everyone who's already joining us and going to uh, be adding in as, as I see the numbers continuing to go up here. Welcome. We're really excited to bring you today's training. It's being brought in partnership with the Person Center, which you will learn more about from Lul, and the National Women's Law Center's Legal Network for Gender Equity team. Today, you're going to be learning about Trauma 101, Understanding Trauma Impacts, and Tools to Support Clients with Trauma Histories. And we are very excited to having you all join us today, but as a friendly reminder, you should have also received a link to help prepare you for today's discussion. Lindsay is going to be dumping that into the chat. Lindsay from our team is behind the scenes, keeping everything organized here. She's gonna send um, in the chat here, the link that you all should have received via email last night. And this includes all of the relevant CLE uh, materials for the webinar. That's the slides, our bios, supplemental materials, and even the agenda for the day. So if you're interested in receiving the one and a half New York CLEs for professional practice credits, um, in order to get that credit after the event, please make sure that you are filling out the evaluation and the attorney affirmation form that's available in the link that's in the chat there. And I just also want to let folks know that you can provide those forms after you've completed them to Jessica Sanchez, who is our CLE provider at HGS. And we did receive a note in the email that went out last night. There was a misspelling in her email. So Lindsay's also already put into the chat the correct email for Jessica. Um, and we'll remind you at the end of the training today about those two forms to make sure you get the CLE credit. But we also do want to note that in order to receive the credit, you will have to be on the lookout for two CLE codes that we're going to go ahead and announce throughout the training today. I'll announce them live and Lindsay will keep you on track and make sure they also end up in the chat for folks who don't want to miss them. And uh, you'll need those in order to verify attendance for CLE credits. And just thanks in advance for um, everyone that um, you know is, is not only taking part in this training today, but is going to be utilizing the opportunity to um, go ahead and receive those CLE credits. So with all of the formalities, um, I also just wanted to note that we do have closed captioning available. Lindsay's gonna put information in the chat about um, how you can turn that on and utilize that if it's gonna make today's information more accessible for folks. And we're gonna go ahead and jump in because we have an exciting afternoon planned. And I promise I'm gonna introduce myself. I know I just jumped right in, but before I talk a little bit about who I am, Lindsay and our team and what our perspective is, how we come into this work, thinking about the neurobiology of trauma and how it impacts legal clients specifically, we really wanna know about those of you that are in this virtual room with us, looks like we're at about 70 folks right now, um, it would be really helpful if you don't mind just putting in the chat here um, your name, what firm or what organization you're joining us from. It really gives us a good sense of who we're having this conversation with. And as you're putting that in the chat, if you feel comfortable to give us a little note about how many years of experience you have working as a legal professional in whatever role that you play. Um, those years of experience will come up later and they're very important in how we think about how we're gonna present the material for you all today. And I'll circle back to this after we introduce ourselves. But my name is Bridget Stump and I have the honor and privilege of leading um, Network for Victim Recovery of DC, which is a holistic uh, service provider for those who've experienced harm through violence in the District of Columbia, both with advocacy and legal services, I'm one of our co-founders that started the organization. Um, it'll be actually just over 10 years. We're having our 10-year celebration um, in May, which is really exciting. And the perspective that I bring is unlike Lul, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't have a specific background in neuroscience. I'm a little bit of a nerd about it, but really what I know is that working with survivors of trauma and getting trauma education changed me as a lawyer and it changed me as a leader. 
And I've taken those practices and those skills and tried to um, figure out ways that we can dialogue with other experts in these spaces um, and really um, just learn from each other on how we can um, allow our clients to show up fully in, in their lived experience and their identities to have the best attorney-client relationship. And so I'm seeing folks putting some stuff in. I'll circle back to that. Um, Lindsay, as I mentioned, is our head of services behind the scenes who's available to help us out. Appreciate her time and energy. And I want to just pass it over to Lowell to introduce the person center and her role there as well. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lil Mahmoud, and I am uh, the executive director of the Person Center. Uh, the Person Center is a small nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that serves African immigrant and refugee survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Um, our work really began with the, uh, the immense legacy of Amelia Misailetis, who is a social worker and an Ethiopian immigrant herself. And her dream was to build an organization that supported these survivors who are often uh, left in the margins. Many of times they have many uh, unique challenges that they experience. And so our work as a culturally specific provider is to offer person-centered, trauma-informed and um, justice-oriented care for survivors. And so our work is growing every single day and uh, we're just excited to be able to, to partake in uh, presentations like these in order to give um, some uh, unique perspectives in terms of uh, the understanding around trauma, how that appears in individuals, and how we as providers in, in every essence and in every sector here can better serve uh, underprivileged and underrepresented communities. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lul, for partnering in this and all that you do to support survivors in our community. I'm really excited to bring this information to folks all over the country. And I'm circling back to that question I asked about the years of experience. Um, Lindsay's quickly doing the math, and I know we've actually gone over 150 years. I also just want to give a shout out. Um, I noticed that uh, we've, we have Adelaide here from Protect Our Defenders, and um, I saw you trying to slide it into my chat, and now I have to acknowledge that you're here. It's great that you're joining us. Uh, I just want to say that what we know is you don't wake up one day and figure out how to navigate all the challenges that trauma presents um, for individuals, for their families, as a, as a helper, right? Someone in the helping profession. But what we know is that you all are bringing over 150 years of experience working with survivors, many of them who probably do have lived experiences and histories of trauma. And the goal of this discussion is not for us to show up and sort of teach you something, but really to facilitate learning by pulling from the experiences and understanding that you have, and hopefully just enhancing some of those skills and strategies based on our own individual experiences and um, some of the best practices that we've learned and the roles that we play. So there was a reason that we asked about how long you've been doing this work. Um, and we're really excited to have this, this discussion where we're gonna get to cover not only the neuroscience of trauma, what happens in the brain and behavior, and some of those um, challenges and barriers that trauma presents to survivors who really want to access um, legal services and access to justice, and sometimes trauma just makes that complicated. Then we'll talk about, well, then what do we do knowing those challenges? How do we build trauma-informed communication, trauma-responsive approaches, to ensure that clients can bring their full selves to the attorney-client relationship, whatever role you're in. I know we have some uh, paraprofessionals, we have um, probably legal intake support staff and lawyers. Um, my hope is that whatever role you play in supporting survivors um, or, or even clients who just have experiences with trauma, that this training is just gonna add more tools to your toolbox. In order to just make sure we have shared language to have the most meaningful discussion today, I do wanna give a caveat about language. You'll notice that I use the term victim and survivor interchangeably. Um, that is specifically because in the role that I play, we have crime victims rights lawyers, we enter our parents in the criminal case to independently represent those individual survivors independent of the government. And victim in that context is a legal term of art. It means something that connotes a specific type of legal standing. Um, and so we often use that language as we're talking about the legal rights of crime victims within the criminal legal context. I, however, use the word survivor to describe not only someone who's experienced harm through um, acts of violence, but also someone who has survived trauma. And so you'll notice I use those two terms interchangeably. And I do want to give just a content um, warning about the examples that we're going to use. Many of the examples that I'll share will come from uh, direct experiences I've had um, either myself or with other clients. Um, Lindsay may also jump in with some examples 
um, you know, this is hard work and the stories are, are hard to hear about. Um, and especially if you're already dealing with it and offering support to survivors who've experienced different, you know, complexities of, of trauma. And so just take care of yourself. Um, this is set up in a, a virtual setting. So hopefully that makes that a little bit easier, but Lindsay is behind the scenes. If you need any additional support, feel free to chat privately to the host. Um, and, and hopefully that will give you um, what you need to really fully um, be able to show up and, and get the most out of the discussion today. And I do just wanna highlight that this is just the start. As I mentioned, you're not gonna get 90 minutes on trauma and feel like you're an expert and you know how to solve all the challenges. Um, really, this is the first in a three-part series where we wanna build in a long-term long support structure for you all. And we're designing this series to really build skills for legal professionals who are wanting to enhance trauma-informed representation strategies. And if you would like to hear more after today, we can share how you can join us for part two, which will be trauma-informed legal interviews and intakes. And that one will take place on May 19th. And the final part of this series will be on May 26th, where we will talk about tips for holistic trauma-informed representation, everything from deposition preparation, cross-examination prep. Um, but today's material will really focus on that orientation of the impacts of trauma. And trauma experiences can impact, you know, not only clients' abilities to access their legal goals, but we're going to talk to you about some of those high-level strategies to combat trauma. Um, and the next two parts are going to dive a lot deeper on those practi practitioner pointers related to trauma-responsive lawyering. So buckle up. We're going to jump right in. And I just really like um, to start off as we think about what is trauma and how does it impact the brain and behavior. We have some really great research. And this is actually um, through a report that was released through a study um, and evaluation of best practices that was funded through the Department of Justice's Office for Victims of Crime. And it really just carved out kind of four main pillars of how we can create a best practices and how to respond to someone who's experienced trauma. Now, this evaluation specifically looked at those who had experienced trauma related to crime and victimization. Um, so not surprisingly, right, we see here that what we want to do for someone who has had their power and control taken away from them after victimization is we want to build trust. Um, we want to make sure that we're honoring their choices. We want to um, make sure that they have opportunities for empowerment, giving that trust and agency back to someone who's had that power and control taken away. And that it's really important that we're respectful about um, what safety and trust means to this individual, how we can help create that in our relationship with them, but that we honor the role of their culture, of their identities, and how they may be experiencing not only the trauma event, but the healing that uh, process that comes after that. And so with all of that kind of to set the stage, I have a little example here to illustrate for folks. Um, how difficult it is as a crime survivor who's experienced a trauma event to actually experience the system consistent with those four best practices. Because this is just a snapshot of the DC criminal legal system. And it's just an example. I know you're joining from all over the country, but what this highlights is the complexity and really the confusing system that survivors of trauma who've experienced violence are thrust into with no choice of their own and um, are often asked to navigate this without a lot of um, ability to honor those four best practices because ultimately in a criminal case, the survivor um, is not the, the key decision maker. They're not the final arbiter of how the case progresses, how it moves forward. And so I feel like, you know, if you're familiar with Judith Lewis Herman, she really describes the irony in this in her book so well, her book, Trauma and Recovery. She says here in this quote, if one set out by design to devise a system for provoking intrusive post-traumatic symptoms, one could not do better than the court of law. Because that's what we know to be true. The best practices in mitigating the consequences of trauma say we honor choice, we give options, um, we give agency, um, we honor the, the way that this individual is experiencing the system. But unfortunately, as we look at the criminal legal system as an example, that's not how the system was designed. So what do we do with that? Well, we equip folks who are support structures for survivors navigating the various legal processes, whether that's administrative or civil or criminal in nature, 
And we build tools and strategies to really help combat those challenges um, that, that the unaddressed consequences of trauma cause when survivors are trying to access these legal goals. So we'll jump into talking a little bit about what does that look like and how does understanding what trauma is and how it impacts the brain and behavior help us as helpers um, have more trauma responsive services. And it's a little bit tough, right? Because when we think about shared language and how we all connect in shared language, there isn't this kind of bright line, clear definition of what causes trauma or what is trauma. We know that it's ultimately a series of factors and those factors tend to be something that's dangerous, threatening out of our control. And it does create a sense of helplessness, a sense of loss. Um, for me, I think one of the um, ways that I kind of learned about trauma that really shifted the way I thought about who was experiencing it um, was a study that it's over 15 years old now. It was when I was kind of a baby lawyer getting into the field. There was an evaluation done on two individuals. These were two eight-year-old boys. And in this particular study, they were trying to measure what we often refer to as resiliency, which is essentially one's ability to cope with a trauma exposure in a, a more positive way that has less negative long-term consequences. And what they found with these two eight-year-old boys is that one of them was sexually molested by an adult and the other one was forced to watch. And when they measured resiliency over time of these two boys, it was shocking at the time for the researchers to learn the one who had the more um, serious negative consequences of that, that trauma exposure, it was actually the boy who was forced to watch. And this really shifted the way we thought about trauma, that it had to be some sort of physical injury that we experienced, right? The word trauma comes from the word wound. Um, we've always sort of thought about it as a, a physical injury. And it's really helpful that over the past couple of decades, we broaden the view of how we think about trauma as more um, uh, as a psychological injury. That doesn't have to mean you experience the physical act of trauma um, or even have a physical injury, but that you're exposed to that trauma event, you're a witness to that trauma event. And so hopefully that helps us all kind of broaden the way we think about what trauma is and what can cause trauma. The most important thing to recognize is that trauma is not defined by an event. It's defined by the person who experiences it. And as helpers, I think it's really important to acknowledge how challenging this is because we are designed, we're hardwired as humans to develop a baseline for ourselves of what trauma is, right? So this is something that I would expect to cause trauma. This is something that I wouldn't. And we almost create the scaling of what we expect to cause a trauma exposure. And that's just not aligned with reality because it's all individually defined by the person who's going through that particular event. But what's also really helpful when we look at um, Dr. Sandra Bloom's research around trauma and, and defining what it is and, and this idea of too much stress too fast, what we find in the research is that traumatization occurs when both the internal and the external resources are inadequate to cope with an external threat. And the reason I always highlight this when we orient folks to what trauma is, historically, we really thought, you know, someone's um, sort of uh, lack of resiliency or lack of ability to cope is kind of about how they were designed or what, you know, tools, strategies they have internally. We now know, and Lindsay and I have seen repeatedly in our work with survivors, particularly child survivors of trauma, that the way in which a survivor experiences someone they disclose to. So those folks that are fire, EMS, police, responding in the acute harm, um, and even secondary support systems, parents, loved ones, friends, that that individual may first disclose to, the way in which we respond scientifically has been shown to impact whether or not the brain perceives it is safe to continue to talk about that harm. And so the way that helpers, intake professionals, lawyers, advocates, the way we receive a disclosure of trauma, if we ask a question or if we frame something that feels minimizing or blaming, that could impact that individual survivor's ability to continue seeking help. It actually impacts help-seeking behavior. We've seen this all the time in the context of um, um, 
Title IX litigation and campus survivors of uh, domestic sexual violence stalking. And they will frequently describe that they told their parent and the parent responded with questions about, well, why were you there? Why did you make that decision? And that that delayed help seeking behavior in the future. Um, and so not only do we see it in the research, but we see it show up in the clients we've actually worked with. And so we know that trauma is defined by the individual, but it's also really important to kind of look at, well, what are the types of experiences we think might cause a trauma exposure? Um, I'm not talking about PTS. That's one of the caveats here. I'm talking about the event that causes trauma. PTS is a specific diagnosis. Um, but we know that trauma can come both from events like a single or, or a chronic event, um, often in the context of domestic violence or child abuse, um, elder abuse. And we also know that trauma can come from a set of circumstances, like living within structural racism, experiencing daily harm within systems and structures based on one's identity, and really looking at have those identities historically been marginalized. Trauma is really this broad lived experience. It can be generational. Lul has a beautiful perspective on how it can be perceived based on historical exposure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the most important thing for us all to recognize is that the way that you're working with an individual client in the capacity of um, your role within uh, you know, the legal profession, it may be related to a trauma exposure. They might be experiencing sexual assault or harassment at work or some other um, you know, specific legal issue that has a trauma element to it. But that may not may also not be true. Maybe they have a history of trauma exposure unrelated to the legal need that they're coming in to access help with. And what's really important is that we honor and acknowledge the entire lived experience of our client, right? Because it's not just the need they're bringing to us that's going to impact how they're able to show up and engage in their legal goal. It's their entire identity. It's all of the intersections of their identity and their, their past and prior trauma that could impact how they're showing up. And we'll break down what that looks like specifically through a, a culturally specific lens as we get into some of those tools and strategies. So for ease, we'll break up um, kind of the phases of trauma into the, the initial acute crisis. That's really like the first acute moment in 48 hours-ish up um, after the event happens. And then we'll look at the long-term stress reaction. And the reason we break it up this way is frequently lawyers or those within the legal context are really interacting with clients more in the long-term stress reaction. And the brain is really kind of responding differently in these two phases. And so we'll look at what does that look like? For me, it's really helpful to understand and also to explain to clients the difference between stress and trauma, because there is a difference. Um, and the way that I've sort of learned to describe this is that we experience stress every single day of our lives. Like every day, I'm guessing of the 90 people that I'm looking at, I see Lul smiling like, I've had it today, Lul's had it today. I know Lul's had it for the last, you know, last couple of weeks. Um, we, we deal with it every day of our lives. And the reason we can function normally is that we have essentially equilibrium on what I call our stress spectrum. And so our stress spectrum kind of visualized here for you all, is really just how we navigate stress daily. And so if you imagine that star in the middle, that's our equilibrium. Everyone kind of has a different spot where they hover on their stress spectrum and they feel comfortable. That's our kind of quote unquote normal for each of us. And when you go all the way to like the far right side here, the little explosion, this is the reaction to stress where someone's super hyper, hyper vigilant, right? They're ready, they're on guard. It's the person you kind of bump into and you say hi and they are like, ah, and they're like, they jump a little bit. They're just waiting for something to happen. That's their response to extreme stress. And then on the left end of the stress spectrum, you have dissociation. You have the stress is so much that they're just not even there. They're not processing it. It's not even being computed into our, our sort of processing of, of the data that's coming into our brain. And these are two extremes, right? So you have extreme hypervigilance and extreme dissociation. And most of us don't deal with stress on either end of those extremes. We kind of fall somewhere in the middle, right? But we are able to navigate daily stressors in our life because we have this beautiful thing in our brain. And it's essentially how we understand the world. And so if you think about pieces of a puzzle, and I take this piece and it makes me feel safe, and I take this piece and it makes me feel not safe, I put all of these pieces of how I've navigated and viewed the world, and I put these pieces of the puzzle together, 
it creates a picture. And this picture that I have in my brain that is my understanding of the world is how every time I get stressed out and you know this, this little star here that is my comfort zone gets pushed a little bit outside of that equilibrium because I'm stressed, I'm feeling that stress, my brain references that picture. And it's basically a roadmap that guides me back to my equilibrium. And because I have that built and designed in my brain, I get to experience these daily exposure to stress and I can still continue to go back to my normal and navigate daily in my life. The difference with trauma is imagine you take a bomb and you throw that bomb at that puzzle. And the pieces of how I used to understand and navigate the world, they go so far away from one another that when I'm trying to reference my roadmap to get back to my normal, it does not exist anymore. And I cannot tell you how many surviving family members of homicide that I've worked with who have literally said to me, um, they describe life before um, the loss of their loved one as life before and life after, because literally the way they view the world is different. Um, the way they, they respond to stress is different after that trauma event. Everything about how our brain views safety and views what is safe has changed after a trauma exposure, which is essentially, as I've illustrated here, simply the concept of too much stress too fast. It's outside of our daily window of tolerance where we know how to navigate and get back within that window of tolerance. And so I'll talk a little bit here about um, once uh, the brain activates the trauma response, we're going to look at the parts of the brain. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we know we experience when we start to have a stress activation. Um, and then Lua will jump in a little bit. But for me, I have an important um, example that I like to highlight. Somebody's saying that my screen is fuzzy. I just got to know it. I don't know if my camera is not adjusting. Maybe hopefully that helps. But Lindsay, let me know. Um, it's, it's is it a little fuzzy? It's the PowerPoint, <clears throat> not, not you. Oh, the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Is it a little fuzzy? It is at the top, like where you can see the controls. Okay, let me see if I can minimize this. Um, Lindsay, maybe you can walk me through how I minimize the controls. Maybe that will help. Let's you, see. Here. You should be able to just click on the screen and hide them. Yeah. I'm not That's seeing. weird. Yeah, usually, let's see. Sorry, folks, brief uh, intermission. Court's indulgence as we figure this out. Um, hide video panel. No, I don't want to do that. Here, let's try that. How's that? Yes. A little better? And then move right. it off because now there's just a box. Thanks. Oh, I don't see a box on mine. No, you're all good now. Okay, cool. Okay, perfect. We're all set. We'll jump right back in. So one of the things that I like to think about when we try to put ourselves in the shoes of understanding what trauma survivors experience, we know that they have the factors of, of a trauma exposure, too much stress, too fast, right? And what that is, is really, we're going to talk about the, the cortisol and the stress hormones, right? But I'm getting the signal of danger. So think about moments where you start to feel stress. You know, one example uh, for the 92 folks that are in here, um, it looks like Arlene, you're up first on my list. I'm not going to call on you. Don't worry. But I can imagine just as I, I said uh, Arlene's name, they were like, oh boy, what's going to happen? Am I going to be called on? Am I going to have to come off mute and manage this? And you start to imagine for each one of you in here, if I were to say to you, I'm going to call on you and I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to come in and present this part of the slide with Lou and I, you'd probably start to feel your heart rate going up. You start to get a little bit nervous. That is the physical response to stress, right? We frequently see agitation. So people fidgeting with their pockets, putting their hands in their pockets and all of these things we all know and accept are uncontrollable responses to stress. We do not control it. And the same way we don't control the emotional response that parallels what we will talk about as the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. But the biggest takeaway for me on this is how we use this knowledge as a tool to validate clients' trauma experiences. And I'll use an example. Um, I was representing a, a survivor who had been assaulted at work. Uh, she was a, a nurse, which is, you know, faces the second highest rates of violence in the workplace and had been assaulted um, by an individual who was escorted off of hospital property after he was discharged. She became violent with the hospital security. They escorted him off. And when his aunt got there, she was an elderly woman. 
and she was trying to find him and she was a little, you know, lost and, and kind of where he was. And the nurse feeling badly about this walked um, the aunt outside to where the gentleman was sitting. Oh, and I just used the word gentleman. We're going to talk a little bit about the use of that word and how that shows up in survivors experiences. So Lindsay, hold me to that. Um, but once uh, she turned around, the nurse, um, she turned around, this man uh, got up from be behind her and he punched her in the back of the head. And when she fell down, he pulled her up and there were these series of, of holly bushes. This is a pretty busy hospital in, in the district and um, the middle of the city. And he, he's bending her over these bushes and he's pulling at her, her nursing pants. And if you're familiar with these type of scrubs, they have these very tight drawstrings and are very hard to pull on. And to the point where he actually physically scratched her and she has like permanent scarring in her hips from him scratching at trying to pull her pants down. And as this is happening, um, a fire truck drives by and two uh, firefighters try to intervene. They're approaching very quickly. The man that's assaulting this woman notices he runs in one direction. One firefighter follows um, this individual. The other tries to approach my client. And I've heard this story from her about three times. I knew this um, woman um, already. I knew her to be a very stoic um, individual. And for the first time, when she's telling this story for the third time in the pretrial interview with the prosecutor, she gets emotional. And that was a little surprising to me because I, I just hadn't experienced that yet. And when she gets emotional, um, she tells the prosecutor that she felt really badly because she yelled at the firefighter as he was approaching her and said, don't come any closer to me. And the prosecutor really well intentioned said, oh, I'm sure you just were perceiving a threat. You just went through a really you know, challenging experience. And she very clearly said, no, I yelled at him because I had peed myself and I didn't want that person to see that. And like, what a learning moment for me because I'm recognizing, wow, like I knew that urination is a very common response to trauma because when our autonomic nervous system gets activated, our digestive system um, kind of gets shut off because we don't need that to survive. It's very common for people to urinate or even defecate in a trauma exposure. Um, but the fact that she didn't know that and that we don't talk about that, we don't normalize that, meant it was the one piece of her narrative that she had never shared with me, that she was embarrassed to share with the prosecutor and she didn't even control it. And so thinking about trauma exposures and the clients we're working with, how can we normalize the uncontrollable physical and emotional reactions so that when we get to those pieces of the narrative where they hold shame and blame, which is frequently the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response that we'll talk about, we've created a trust and, an, and, and a sort of an allowance and validation that they didn't make that choice, their body made that choice to keep them alive. And I'll pause there, Lou, in case you want to add anything on, on the emotional responses as well. Of course. Um, one, one thing that I, I like to, to discuss when we talk about these parallel experiences that are occurring within the human body at that moment, it really is important to know that these are happening simultaneously. Um, and so, and there isn't an association of, of one emotional reaction with one physical reaction. Um, a lot of times, you know, if, if someone is in shock or disbelief, they expect, you know, people expect them to be that stoic or, or silent or sitting, or there's an image that we have, you know, uh, associated with what that looks like. But in reality, um, that person who seems very stoic could be experiencing high levels of fear and maybe frustration. There's, it, there's no way to assume or to, ex to expect certain types of reactions are happening at that one time. Um, and also when we talk about recall, that, that having to sit and talk through a story, Every time that somebody re-experiences this trauma, their response can change. Um, and it can be connected to, you know, what kind of uh, healing or care a person has received or lack thereof, or even um, many of times from clients that I have spoken to from our end of it, there are many of times they are surprised by the way that they're reacting. Many of times you'll hear them say, I, I never felt like this before, or I never acted like this when, when, you know, talking through this or before it was so much easier. Now it's harder or the opposite. Um, because many of times this is happening at once. And when we're also talking about that stress component um, for many survivors, it's a 
it's chronic stress that is that they are experiencing at this point. Um, many of times in, in with in traumatic experiences, you would imagine, you know, stress level will increase at one point and then it will come back down because that was a isolated event. But many of times stress becomes chronic at that moment. And I, and I believe I, I'll speak for myself, but I can imagine that everyone here has experienced periods of chronic stress, um, whether, you know, I, I can remember when I was in graduate school feeling consistent level of, of chronic stress and how that is taxing on the body. Imagine these reactions happening regularly and the level of stress remaining high and the impact that can have on an individual's well-being. Um, and the only the, the, the final thing I wanted to add in terms of the emotional reactions um, are also very much culturally specific um, in terms of you know how individuals process anger or fear or how they um, have been you know, taught to experience those emotions, um, how they are taught to, to discuss those emotions can change. And so when um, working with an individual from a, a very different culture or idea of, especially when it comes to the, the gender binary, how people identify themselves within certain expectations or roles um, associated with the, the, the gender that they were assigned, um, many of times, you know, they, they're not, they're not supposed to act X, Y, or Z, even though it's very difficult for them to fight that emotional response off does not mean that they're not feeling it. Um, you know, what we perceive, you know, it's very much phenotypic if we think about it, like what we see um, is very, very different at times from what's happening inside uh, for that individual. So it is, it is extremely, extremely individual specific. Um, and, you know, it, it just, shows us that there is so much more to learn and to look out for when working with individuals who experience uh, trauma at this, at this extent. It's a really great point because it makes it harder, right? It makes our jobs harder if we have to understand how unique and individualized trauma responses are, both physically and emotionally. So we'll shift a little bit, thanks so much for those additions, Lul, into um, trauma in the brain and we're going to start by looking at what I call the breakfast part of the brain. That's not a real thing. Don't call it that. Um, but our frontal lobe cortex, the reason I refer to it as our breakfast part of the brain is, um, you know, if I, if I were to ask folks in here, who, who was able to make breakfast this morning, if you had the time and the capacity and um, were motivated to do that, you would be able to tell me what you ate, the order you put it together. Um, you know, did you bake the toast first? Did you put anything on it? Um, you would be able to tell me all of that because you are able to recall those day-to-day -day memories that you experience in a very chronological, logical way because you're utilizing your frontal lobe to recall those memories. And that's really important. This is the part of the brain that really shapes our logical, um, you know, sort of processing our rationale. It's a big part of who we are, but it really helps us store memories in a way that we can access them in a more chronological and linear way. The problem is that it's not used when we're talking about the trauma response. Um, I don't know if folks have ever heard this before, but we say that you actually have, uh, you can illustrate a brain with your, with your hand. So if you put your thumb in the middle of your palm here, um, this is the thumbnails, the amygdala that I'm gonna talk about, talk about that activates our stress response. The thumb is the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain involved in recalling trauma memories differently than when you close your hand, the fingers are the frontal lobe. And so when we say things like they flipped their lid, it's because they're not thinking rationally anymore, right? This is the rational part of the brain. This is our survival part of our brain. Some folks refer to it as more primal kind of lizard brain. Um, and that's because it's keeping us alive. So when we say things like the person flipped their lid, it means they're not being rational anymore because that part of the brain is not in tune. It's not turned on. And so the, the what I'm talking about in the amygdala is the, is the thumbnail. This is a really cool part of the brain. It, we think it was designed about 50,000 years ago when we had to protect ourselves from threats like a saber-toothed cat. I've been really intentional about saying cat because I always thought it was a tiger and my son like constantly corrects me that it's a saber-toothed cat. So I'm doing my best to get it right. But imagine 50,000 years ago, you have this giant cat charging at you. It wouldn't make any sense for your frontal lobe to be online and you know, you've got thousands of data points coming in, you can only process 40 at any given moment. And so it doesn't make sense for your brain to slow down and be like, hmm, compared to other cats in the region at the rate and velocity at which this one is charging me, I have a 75% chance of living if I climb this tree versus clay dead. Like none of that would make sense. 
And so we were designed with an amygdala to say, turn off the logical part of my brain because I need to stay alive. And the amygdala works with our fight, flight, freeze, bond activation. It, uh, it really turns on that autonomic nervous system that separates everything very quickly into safe or unsafe. This is gonna keep me alive, this is not. And it really is the part of the brain that determines a response to a threat that is a trauma event. And again, this shows up in what we refer to as fight, right? So physically fighting the threat, um, light, very common, running away, or sometimes even just dissociation. Um, we all commonly now more recently refer to that as a freeze where the person does nothing at all um, and can be sort of catonic in their response. Freeze can even be an element that happens before the flight or um, the fight or flight. So you're sort of processing the data very quickly, freezing and then having a fight or flight reaction. But fawn is a rather new one. Um, and fawn is a response that we frequently see in child survivors, where the person who's causing the trauma has authority and control over an individual, and they fawn or comply with requests, demands in order to stay alive. And this is um, sort of the complexity of trauma is that our understanding of the neurobiology and how we respond and why it's really evolving. Like fawn is really a new one in just the last few years that we're starting to better understand. And I think we'll continue to, to evolve Involved. But what's a really important thing for a lawyer or a legal professional to know is that often the parts of someone's narrative, the, the, the details of, of the legal um, facts that you need of how did you respond and what did you say and why, a lot of those pieces might be really tangled with their fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. And they may attach shame and blame because they don't know why they didn't scream. They don't know why they didn't fight back. And so being, again, able to normalize that this is a natural response that the body and brain has to too much stress too fast to keep you alive is a really great way to start um, educating clients on why um, that shame and blame is misplaced because it was not a conscious choice that they made. And so this is a picture that I'm going to walk you through. I have forever been trying to find ways that I can show how true this fight, flight, fr uh, freeze response is without um, causing people to have trauma exposures. These are from a haunted house. They're not, these are not real pictures of people in danger, but I found this haunted house that posted pictures at a part in, in the haunted house where it was a really scary thing that happened. And then they just posted these pictures of like, oh, come, you know, look at us. We have lots of scary things. Not my thing, but for people who like that. But what I I love about this illustration is that I'm able to show you in the real world, look at this woman. She's physically fleeing, like she's jumping. She's literally jumping into the other woman's arms. This is a physical manifestation of the, the flight response. You see um, the freeze happening here. I call it the blowfish effect. Sometimes we get really big because we're like scared. You see both the combination of the flight and the freeze in the back. Um, one woman is sort of looking for a door, it appears, trying to get out of the room. This one we debate all the time. Is this a fight response? Is this a freeze response? Lots of people have theories about the thumb in the fist, out of the fist. I interpret this as more of an agitated fight response. Um, again, you have sort of the combo fight, flight, freeze going on. I actually interpret this one as more of a fight response. You see the protectionary, he wraps his hands all the way around the people that are behind him. I very much view this one as more of a protectionary response. Um, but again, you get to see how real and uncontrollable this reaction is um, from these, these real world pictures. And hopefully that's a helpful way to just kind of capture what is happening in the brain. Um, I think probably the most challenging thing for practitioners is that after we have a trauma exposure, after that fight, flight, freeze, fawn response happens, the brain takes a picture of that. And this is what makes trauma so hard is that we have to hold both our bravest and our most heartbreaking moments at the simultaneously. We were so brave in that our brain knew what to choose to keep us alive. But however, the brain is designed because of this hippocampus, the part of the brain that takes essentially a picture after a trauma exposure, and it does this really intentionally. Because if I can store my trauma memories and access them through my hippocampus, not the breakfast frontal lobe kind of linear chronological processing, if I store them here, what I'm able to do is I essentially create a template of danger. And so in the future, and this is really what our brains are designed for that I've learned, our brains are really just designed to predict what we need future behavior to be based on past experiences. And so the hippocampus 
creates this little template that says, if I see, feel, hear, smell, anything, a sense that's like 10 to 20% close to that prior trauma exposure, I'm going to have a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response because the brain thinks it perceives there's actual danger, even in moments where it may not exist. And I think where this is um, particularly challenging when I think about the complexity of identities and lived experiences, you know, I did this training with a local police department and afterwards one of the officers came up and he was like, oh, this is really helpful. I appreciate the information, which is always great to hear. But he said, you know, my wife was recently robbed outside of our apartment. And he said, every time she goes outside, his words were, she freaks out. And the recognition he was having was that her brain's template of danger, where it perceived real threat, was every time she walked back into that environment. So I start to think about people who are experiencing trauma at the workplace, people who have experienced victimization while incarcerated, people who do not have a choice to control the environment they have to continuously put themselves in and how exhausting that is when you are constantly living with a perceived threat, a real perceived threat activating your fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. So at this point, we're going to move into, well, how does this show up for you and your clients? Lindsay's putting into the chat here our first code for all of those New Yorkers getting your CLEs out of the way here. Our first code um, for CLE credit is NVR, um, like Network Victim Recovery 428, today's date. So NVR 428, this is code one. You'll get code two here briefly. Um, as we move into the discussion, we're going to look a little bit deeper at these barriers when individual survivors who have these trauma exposures or trauma histories are trying to access legal support. Because what we know is that we are hardwired to be able to predict future threats. And that sometimes shows up in places where there is no real threat. And emotionally that can be so disruptive on survivors' lives. I mean, can make them vulnerable to interpret threats in places where it doesn't exist. I think the biggest takeaway here is if you're an intake professional, if you're a paraprofessional, if you are a person, if you are a lawyer building a legal strategy and case, and you have to get into the details of the narrative, the who, what, why, where, how did you respond? What did you do before and after? All of these questions, um, I think what's really challenging about that is those questions and, and, and alone by themselves can be enough to trigger that template of danger. We can be the individual who's causing the trauma reminder. And so being really conscious about how do we navigate that reality as a helper. I also want to just highlight um, for lawyers who have to really think about credibility and how we societally expect chronological linear memories from trauma exposure, which we know is like not consistent with our understanding of the science. We can expect that when we're asking someone about what they ate for breakfast today, um, but we can't expect that when we're asking someone about a trauma event that's not being pulled from that frontal lobe. Um, and so what that means is really be familiar with researchers like Rebecca Campbell. She really coined the term as a researcher, neurobiology of sexual assault. And she talked about how we now understand that trauma recall of memories is very different than our day to day. And as practitioners, we're kind of taught that with time, the chronological memories that our frontal lobe accesses actually gets um, worse, right? We're taught like over time, our memories break down and that all makes sense when we're talking about the breakfast part of the brain. But when we're talking about trauma memories, it's actually the opposite. And this is very confusing because we know from the neurobiology that once a trauma event happens and we have 48 hours or maybe two sleep cycles, depending on when that individual sleeps, our ability to connect those trauma memories actually improves. It actually gets better. And what's so difficult about this is think about how we design investigative systems or in, um, trained investigators. You know, you're supposed to go in right after the acute harm. We expect many survivors of trauma to immediately call the police or call 911, which is not the lived experience of most folks who experience harm. Um, and then when they talk about that later, or when there's a follow-up interview with an investigator, or maybe they're talking to a lawyer who's comparing their statement with a prior statement that would have happened right after the acute event, we know that the science actually expects there to be some differences. And that's because imagine today, I were to say to you, you know, we're going to take all these little sticky notes and I'm going to put them in front of you. And I'm going to ask who's in front of me, Amelia, 
I'm going to say, Amelia, I need you to write everything that Lula and I are saying down on these sticky notes. And I have little heart shaped kind and I have big ones and I have little ones. And when Amelia is done taking all of the notes today, I mix them all up on Amelia's desk and I put them under the desk and behind the desk and all over. And then I say, represent the discussion. All of that data is there, but Amelia's ability to connect those sticky notes in a linear chronological way is going to take time. And that's how trauma memory recall works in the hippocampus. We know within 48 hours or two sleep cycles, our ability to connect the sticky notes, which is the, the memory of the trauma event actually gets better. And I'll just highlight before I turn it over um, to Will to talk a little bit about some of these barriers that we know and, and how trauma impacts our ability to support clients with trauma histories. We actually know a lot about trauma and memory based on military service members from brain scans of individuals who had served in military combat and had self-disclosed chronic trauma exposure. And what's fascinating is when we did these brain scans of individuals with chronic trauma exposure to individuals who had not self-identified experiencing that, the hippocampus, the part of the brain that stores these memories, right, that is involved in the recall of trauma memories was 8% smaller in individuals who had had chronic trauma exposure. And we don't really quite understand why there's theories about does chronic release of cortisol like physiologically change the hippocampus? Does it shrink it? Um, but these are all the evolving ways that we're coming to learn um, that chronic trauma can even impact our ability to recall those memories because the physiological changes are actually making and shrinking the part of the brain that stores those memories. Um, it's getting smaller. It's being, it's being physically impacted. So Lou, I'm gonna kick it over to you to the next um, few slides as we think about the long-term phase and how we can expect trauma to show up as a barrier. Most definitely. This is, um, you know, I feel like it's easier for people to wrap their mind around that the, the shorter timeline, what happens in that in that moment. And I think we have, you know, a television and, and so on to blame for that because it has kind of packaged what a trauma response should look like, quote unquote, what it should look like, which unfortunately has influenced how people, you know, perceive things or expect things to go about. And it, it, it's, it's unfortunate because what it does is, is in the example that you posed, it, it brings ab about like shame and confusion among individuals and in why am I reacting this way? Why is, is my body acting in, in this way and making me think like this or feel like this? Um, and so I think in the long, the long term is really an important perspective to look at, especially um, when in, in our work, when we're looking at restoring the individual, we want them to come back to a place where they feel strong again, they feel as though, you know, they are, uh, you know, able to overcome the experiences that they have had and that it doesn't define them and so on, which is a very individualized experience. However, it's important to look at a little bit of the neuroscience, the physiological, the behavioral and emotional um, long-term effects or reaction to trauma. Um, and so one, one, one component that's really important to understand is that, you know, it is an, it, there is an experience that now has resulted in trauma that results in um, an individual being changed biologically, experiencing a change within their mind that has now affected, in essence, who they are, what they see, how they see life before the, the traumatic event and how they see life after it. Um, and a, as you mentioned earlier, it, this is something that is experienced by those who are not the direct victim of a crime. It can happen to family members, it can happen to community members, it can happen to individuals who are associated with that person and the experiences that they have. This can also be seen in groups. So in communities, as I mentioned before, if there is a traumatic event in the sense of um, a, uh, a hate crime occurs within a close-knit community. Even though it impacts one individual, the rest of the community can be found to have their own traumatic responses, own stressors that are related to reminders or triggers to, to, to that traumatic event. So it's important to recognize that this is not just a um, uh, an, uh, something to look at with a clinical perspective, but it is something to look at with a public health perspective, where we look at how it affects not just the individual, but the group, the community, and overall. 
So when we talk about, you know, the, the long-term reaction, I think it's really important to also discuss uh, intensified traumatic memories or something called flashbulb memories. So this is when your hippocampus is in overdrive. And so when you are, uh, when you in interact with a certain trigger, whether it is an internal trigger or an external trigger, those internal ones being, you know, a, a heightened anxiety in the moment, feeling anger from an unrelated issue. So you'll see in, in some cases, like I remember with one client being frustrated in the grocery store with someone not understanding her English. It was a very frustrating back and forth. And then she began to experience um, a trigger from that argument, that the anger that came from that, she started to feel triggered and, and, and was re recalling back to a traumatic memory of hers. So that's an internal stressor. It really is based off of what that individual is feeling, what's going on. It could be sadness one day or whatnot that's bringing about this traumatic uh, trigger. There's also the external triggers, which we are more likely to be able to control as individuals as supporting and assessing um, a victim of crime, what we'll see is uh, the, a location, um, the weather of that day, for example, specific dates or anniversaries to recall. Um, these can also include uh, things that, you know, you wouldn't expect, like smells. Uh, many of times it's important to recognize there's a strong sensory relationship between uh, smells and memory. Um, and you'll probably know that if you think about, you know, some of your fondest childhood memories. I know for myself, it's when I first, when I had my first, uh, what are they called in English? They're um, those, uh, those funnel cakes. The first time I had a funnel cake at a fair, I will always remember that smell and everything associated with it. Some sensory, that sensory association with a memory is very, very powerful. And for survivors, for example, if they are, um, for example, we work with survivors from civil war or um, who had to migrate as refugees to the US. Something like that, a smell that will remind them will be, for example, if they smell gasoline, if they smell, um, if they smell a certain, uh, certain burning smell, they'll remember something that happened that is extremely triggering and it'll remind them of that experience. And this is really important for us in terms of serving these, these uh, survivors is how we can modulate the environment that they have to interact with um, in order to reduce the level of stress that they're experiencing in that moment. Obviously, our role is not to remove the, the, the trauma from the individual. Uh, there's no way that we can do that. At, at, but what we can do is, mo is uh, monitor the individual and do what we can to change the environment. Some other triggers that uh, people don't really you know, recognize until you kind of in the moment. Um, we had a, we had a client who did not want to be separated from their child um, because the last time they were separate, separated from their child, it was it was a long term separation that they were not prepared for, um, which occurred as a result of the father of the child taking the child without her knowledge. And so when we would sit down to to interview her, her or speak with her, the child had to be with in her uh, uh, visual distance, in a sense where she would need to see the child in order to feel comfortable, in order to be able to take part in whatever we called her uh, to take part in. And so these little environmental changes are really, really important because when we're talking about what, what how people respond to triggers, it's not just, you know, what we experience in terms of people feeling panicky or feeling like they're back in that place again. These triggers can also be very faint or hard to see or recognize, in, including a sudden change in mood, um, fatigue. Many of times fatigue will overwhelm an individual and, you know, I can't move forward with this anymore or um, I feel really tired. Even your five minutes in, a trigger can change the entire dynamic and affect an individual on such a, on a physical level. Um, on top of that, we notice with um, with mothers that we work with, um, desensitization is a challenge that they experience in their everyday life. Um, when they're raising their children, they're in the the hustle and bustle of their regular day. When they're triggered and uh, triggered by either the exhaustion, the anxiety, the frustration, they become desensitized. They stop. They can't pay attention to certain things, and they find themselves spending hours upon hours unable to focus, unable to connect with their child, unable to work, unable to do the the basic functions of of everyday life, which is the 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 essential uh, challenge of what mental health challenges and conditions where it is affecting an individual's 
well-being and ability to function on a day-to-day life. And so triggers are varied. They are diverse in terms of how an individual experiences them. Um, They range from physical to the emotional, psychological. um, And many of times you don't know which trigger is going to come in and you don't know what response is going to come from it. And so it is really important for us to be cognizant of that variety there and to be understanding of how an, an individual is also experiencing it, whether it's the first time that they're having, for example, the first time they're experiencing suicidal ideation, how do we react to that? How do we uh, get them the care that they need in response to that? It'll also be the first time that, you know, they were usually able to go to school, handle this, handle that, and then all of a sudden, for a couple months, it's a it's a time where they just can't get not a single thing done. And so this this changes regularly and it is dependent on the individual, but it it just shows us the holistic impact that trauma can have on an individual and really does make us question, you know, why why as a society do we place so much value on physical impairment? Not value, I wouldn't say that's not the right word, but why do we put more trust in physical ailment in comparison to mental ailment? Because trauma like this has both physical, emotional, psychological uh, impact on an individual. And so it's important for us to recognize it at, at, for its level of severity and care for individuals accordingly. Yeah, such, such a good point. And as you talk about this individual unique um, reliving of, of past trauma exposure, I think from my lens, you know, working both as an advocate and a lawyer, a couple of examples that kind of stand out to me in this list that may resonate with some of the practitioners that are joining us today. One that stands out for me is that I see, I would say the two I see commonly are minimization and restricted affect. And for minimization, uh, the the case that kind of jumps out to me is one um, where uh, we supported an individual who accessed a sexual assault forensic exam. It was one of the few exams that actually showed um, very significant injuries. That's for lots of medical reasons. That's fairly uncommon in sexual violence. Um, it uh, she described a very violent assault. I was there with her when she made the initial report um, after receiving that same exam. And in the middle of of that report, she paused and she said, um, and I'm not saying it was violent. I mean, but she described a very violent assault. Um, I'll I'll just sort of spare the details. And what was interesting is that as as civil litigation um, uh, kind of moved forward, one of the defense's arguments was that she was not credible because the police report detailed a violent assault, but she had said to the police officer, I'm not saying it was violent. And it was really unpacking those narratives that we are, are sort of um, conditioned to say, well, you know, historically before 2008, um, the, the FBI defined sexual assault as one that include force. And we didn't change that definition until 2008. And, and even jurisdictions have not quite all um, resolved the issue of, of sexual um, assault or rape requiring the use of force. And all that is to say, we have all been taught um, that survivors should behave in a certain way. If you've watched or read um, an unbelievable rape story by ProPublica or seen the, the series, um, it's a really great representation of how what's really challenging for survivors with complex trauma histories is that they may actually present very resilient. They may actually have a very stoic presentation because they are so resilient from past trauma exposure. And then that actually shapes how they're believed, how their credibility is shaped by those around them and who expects them to behave in a certain way. And minimization really comes up, I've noticed in the language that survivors, particularly survivors of sexual assault use. And then the restricted affect, I think everyone in this room can probably relate to that moment where you're having a really hard, stressful conversation and the person you're talking to I've experienced this like in the medical context, right? The person you're talking to, they're not in the room anymore. I call it the glassy eyes. Like they're just not there. And and, and it's this extreme stress response to dissociation where they're just kind of frozen and, or, you know, freezing and not in the room anymore. Think about how many conversations you've had with clients where they're not there. That can be a trauma manifestation. And we as lawyers are sometimes conditioned to think when the client's not calling me back, when they're not showing up to meetings, when they're just not paying attention, we're, we're kind of taught to think that's disengagement or maybe that they lost, they've lost the um, kind of shared legal goal and, and the drive towards the outcome. And so it's really a challenge to confront our own um, 
maybe um, societal understandings of how clients present and really dig into the nuance of how much of this is what we believe it to be versus how much of it is just a manifestation that we have reminded them of a prior trauma and their brain is having that fight, flight, freeze or fawn response in those moments. Um, and, and what this means, right? What it actually does not to be like a total downer in this presentation, I promise we'll, we'll get back to a kind of positive framing. But the reality of understanding trauma better, when you understand the neuroscience of trauma, your job is harder. Your job as a lawyer is harder. Your job in intake is harder. Doing trauma-informed interviews is harder. Being a support system, whether you're a parent, a friend, whatever it is, when you understand how trauma is so complex and the way people acutely experience it, the reminders they live with for the rest of their life, regardless of the support systems they have in place, and how we can inadvertently be the cause of those reminders, your job gets harder. It's actually harder to be a trauma-informed, trauma-responsive lawyer because you understand that survivors may not recall every detail of what they've experienced. You understand that they may forget certain aspects. We have heightened sensory perception during trauma exposure and even desensitized um, sensory perception. They may have an unawareness of what their response even was if they dissociated and don't recall those behaviors. And more importantly, from a legal context, from a legal perspective, we expect survivors um, of trauma, whatever um, kind of legal system they're navigating, to have linear chronological memories. And that's just not what the science says. That's just not what we can expect. Even if they're presented in a way that feels like it's linear, um, that's because they've had those sleep cycles to sort of get to attaching the, those memories and the sticky notes together. And so this is why your job gets harder because we really become the support system to help solve the ways that trauma presents challenges in accessing legal goals. And so we're gonna go ahead and give you, as we shift into the, the closeout of the training today, the second and the last code for your CLEs today. Um, WDC, we had to give a shout out to Washington DC. So WDC 022, um, Lindsay's gonna go ahead and put that code in there. Um, and again, uh, this is second uh, of the CLEs that you'll need to submit when you submit your forms. We'll give you a final reminder at the closeout here. And I'm really excited for Lul and I to just close out with kind of the meat of what we hope you get out of today's training, which is, well, what do we do about all of this, right? How do we create empowering and um, really dignified experiences for the clients we have, whether they're coming to us with a trauma exposure issue um, in their legal matter, or they're just coming with a complex set of lived experiences and, and histories of trauma. And these are really kind of the high level principles of how you create a trauma responsive practice. We're not going to go into all of them in a great amount of detail because that, as I said, will be the focus of um, series two, where you'll get to have Lou and I together um, with Lindsay joining us as well. So we're just going to kind of walk through and we'll invite you to jump in anytime here. Some of these high level strategies to start thinking about as we move into the follow up discussion in this series. The biggest one goes right back to the start of our conversation today, which is we look for opportunities to build choice, right? And those can be big and small. And trauma means someone's power and control has been taken away. We minimize the consequences of that by recreating agency. And as a lawyer, I've done this in asking not only about where do you wanna meet? Where do you wanna sit in the room? Are you comfortable with the temperature? Do you, you know, all of the questions that we can sort of build into um, creating a comfortable environment, they're really opportunities for choice. Um, and this gets a little harder in the virtual context. And, you know, we've brainstormed, well, how do we talk about, do you want your camera on? Do you want your camera off? There's always an opportunity for choice. And as you do that, What's fascinating, and we'll talk about this in part two, there's also a neuroscience to trust and there's behaviors and things that we do as lawyers and support staff that actually create more oxytocin. They create more ability to bond and have shared experiences of trust. And one of the ways we do that is we give people choice, right? Little, tiny, simple ways, big ways. Um, I think the sort of um, tension for me is that as a lawyer, I was trained to have all the answers and I was trained to give direction and I was trained to be in control. And this is really about 
Um, and many of you doing this work, I assume being in this room, you already understand this. With trauma survivors, it's about shared power, not having power over them, even when we're in an authority um, role as a, as a helper, whether that's intake support staff, legal support staff, or a lawyer, it's figuring out how do we create shared power when I maybe do have more expertise or knowledge about how to navigate a system? How do I create choice and opportunity for me to make the, the client feel like a shared equal power in that process? And that takes a lot of practice. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in parts two and three. Lul, what would you add to that? I would just add um, in terms of that, the concept of trust um, with the way trust and authority function is many of times because of authority, people will you know, give, give in to the decisions or the, the, the choices made by the authority figure in that case. Having authority does not mean that you have trust just because that individual is letting you do that. Trust is a is a is a two way really is a two way street, and it is a one that has to be actively worked on. So ensuring and checking that that person really trusts the decision that you're making, um, and you'll know like it's it's one of those ways you'll know if an individual actually trusts you when you are you know gauging their ideas and what they want and seeing where they are and letting them dictate you know what the next next step is where we're going and how we're going to do that um because then when you when you have trust you can feel more you can feel grounded in in taking charge and in providing the resources and care and support to that individual um knowing that you know they're receptive and that they're going to more than likely follow through when when they do have that trust it's so true because the the like cornerstone of trust is that the person does what's expected. And I think that's such a good segue into this idea of expectation setting and pacing. I sometimes find myself jealous of folks that have like mental health um, support roles because pacing is a really great tool, right? It means when you show up to talk to your therapist and you're like, I'm just not up for it today. The therapist is like, great, no problem. We'll deal with that later. Lawyers don't always have the same flexibility to pace. And so what we do is we actually use boundaries and we use expectation setting, not only to enhance trust, because then we do what we said we're going to do through this expectation setting process, but we build in pacing techniques. And an example of this, it's going to, some of you are going to get the hives when I say this, because it takes a lot of time. And I know you're busy folks, but the way we do this as lawyers, Lawyers is if we don't have the flexibility, because let's say we're working on a civil protection order, right? We, we've got about a two week turnaround, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. We've got to get build a full case. We're going to have a full mini trial. We need to have evidence. We're going to be calling witnesses and we got to prepare this person really truncated, abbreviated window. We don't have the ability to always say, oh, we don't have to talk about that today. But what I can do is I can get in front of the trauma um, response, the, the reminder that may trigger the dissociation, the glassy eyes, by saying to the client, when we meet tomorrow, these are the goals that I have. This is the piece of information I'm going to need from you. What do you need from me? If we don't get to those things, if it's just too challenging, I've reserved X amount of time the next day. And then we have our hearing on, you literally lay out a roadmap for them of how they will experience you. And then you do that. And I think what gets really important is if you make an agreement with the client that let's say you're going through kind of like civil um, litigation and there's some negotiation about a settlement back and forth, you make an agreement. How frequently do you want to hear from me? How do you want me to share information and updates? How much is too much? How much is too little? Maybe the client says, I just want a quick email every two weeks, even if it's that you don't have anything new to tell me, just to say nothing new to tell you. Then you have to stick to that. And there's lots of really, really good anecdotal experience that we have that telling clients, I don't have an update for you, is actually good in trust building and much better than saying nothing, than just saying, well, I didn't tell you anything, so I didn't have anything new to tell you. So expectation setting does this really beautiful thing of not only minimizing trauma responses because the client knows what's coming, they're not surprised, they expect that they're going to be talking about the difficult parts of the narrative that might be a trauma reminder, but it also allows you to create trust when you do what is expected of you. And I will say, like, believe it or not, I am not as good as Lindsay's team and the advocates that we have that have really effective breathing strategies. When you start to see those glassy eyes and you know this person's in their limbic system, they're not in the, the frontal lobe. When you know that's happening, you can ground that person by having them focus on the painting in the room, describe the painting that they see. Um, and, and there's really cool techniques. But for me, the like hack that I learned about was water. 
And I actually use it sometimes with my kids when they're just so in, in their feelings about what's happening. And they're, they're starting to, you see the autonomic nervous system. Remember our breathing increases, our heart rate goes up. What I learned is when someone drinks water, it actually naturally regulates our breathing and it calms the autonomic nervous system's response. And it can be a way we shift from the trauma brain to our frontal lobe, to our rational brain. And of course you wanna do this in a way that engages empowerment in the client, but it can be something as simple as like, Whew, we've been talking a long time. I'm feeling really thirsty. I'm just going to go grab a couple cups of water. I come in, I put the water in front of them and say, if you want some, I got some for you. You create opportunity and choice, but you also give them a tool to naturally calm that activation of the trauma response. Um, and these are just a couple of the highlights that we'll dig into more. Lul, did you want to add anything else there before we talk a little bit more about sort of general communication considerations? No, I think I think you really summed it up really well, especially with that example, which is really which I think is a really effective one because it responds to first you recognize the emotional signals and then you respond to the physical and it really just shows that it it is a holistic response, which is really effective. Awesome. Well, as we close out, we have some sort of general um, awareness tips as we think about communication and Lul, I think this is like what you, you focus on daily and the individual support that you offer to survivors, anything that you would want to highlight in terms of general strategies around how we consider the really important cultural norms and expectations that clients might have working with someone in a position of authority. I would say the, the quick, the quick way to remember is to uh, never assume and always ask. Um, uh, you know, we, we assume, I think one thing that we, we struggle with is, oh, I don't want to ask. I don't want them to, to know that I don't know, or to, to feel like I'm, I'm isolating them by asking about this or this or that, um, by asking, it really shows that a, it really shows a, a, first of all, a level of respect and a, uh, a personal, like a desire to learn and, um, and a, and a true care for, to those kind of details. Um, and many of times when, when in our discussion with clients is, you know, we many times they're like, we just wish somebody would have asked us and we would have told them we don't want them to assume this or that. And, and it's also important to recognize that when you're working, especially with um, with minorities, particularly those whose experiences are, you know, are, are unfortunately we, we live in uh, I always struggle to find the right words to say this, but, you know, as a Muslim woman in particular, one thing that I have learned is that um, there is, uh, there unfortunately are larger notions regarding, you know, what people know about a certain group of people. And it's, and it's unfortunate, but the reality is that we have been influenced by ideas as to, you know, who these people really are, what, what, how they think, how they act and so on. And so whether we know it or not, you know, we may have preconceived notions. And so it is, always the right the right way is always to ask um and the and the right way always is to um inquire on why do why do i feel the need to do this or to do that or how why do i feel nervous about how to interact with this individual uh, ask questions about how you're feeling and what you are thinking of doing and then remember this is an individual who can also share their thoughts and their ideas and, and what they're comfortable with what they're not so there's so never assume and always ask and I think also one thing that's really important is that, you know, when it comes to the, the idea of cultural competence, which I struggle to, 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 uh, to understand, is that you will never un understand an individual truly. Um, but what you can do is respect an individual and know that they are the, 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 the experts of their own experience. They are the experts of, you know, what they need and what they would like and how they want to go about certain things. And so why, why do we feel the inclination to, uh, to, to ask others or to do or find answers to this per to how to address a person when the person is right there and can be spoken to? And so it is, it is an, a, a reflex of ours, but I really encourage and urge uh, all of you to to step back from that and remember this is the person who who knows their experience better than anyone else um and and that really goes for what i've experienced with my with my own life is that you know coming from an african immigrant community being a muslim woman as well no matter how much in terms of identity we share every single individual is different in the way that they per like prefer to be approached and how also 
they are, they're experiencing their traumatic experience. And so it's also important to understand that the, the, it also, the coin goes, the, the, there's another side of the coin there where there are perceptions in terms of what, what will a lawyer do for me or what do they know? Or I just have to tr give them everything and follow the, the rules and just listen. And there's a lot of also fear that comes around dealing with a, a legal system. Um, with going forward and getting the help that, that you need, being told that the right decision is to get be, embark on this really difficult and long journey that you know nothing about. And so it's important to recognize, you know, there are other factors that feed into one's, their preconceived notions in terms of what is the system I'm going into? Who is this person who is taking all of my information and this and that? And so it is a, it's a stressful environment for some people because the lack of knowledge or the, the lack of insight in terms of how things are going to progress is, uh, is very uh, um, unnerving. It is very stressful. And so really knowledge is power, giving the person as much information and guidance as you possibly can and giving them space and time to process process it what you that 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 um strategy that you really really lined out about giving someone an, an agenda on what's going to come up allows them to prepare and also prevents what's very common in triggering responses where something happens suddenly or by surprise usually the response to that trigger is is heightened it's even more intense and so when you give a person time and space it prepares them and it may, gives a sense of control and when we talk about victims of, of of crime in terms of domestic and sexual violence particularly they've experienced a trauma that's connected to being stripped of their power and their control and so what we want to ensure is that our priority is harm reduction and we are mitigating the um, additional stressors that can have a person feel as though they have lost power and control once again. Um, and, you know, these these examples are really great in terms of how to actually do this by, you know, following signals, whether it is, you know, getting another individual in the room that can calm them, that is, that is a, a supportive factor when we're talking about clients who also don't speak English. When you're finding an interpreter, find, um, try your best to find an interpreter that actually knows the individual or um, is, is closely connected to them or comes from the same community or, you know, someone that you is one step closer to them than, you know, language line or, or an access line. But we need to understand, you know, resources are tight. There aren't many options. So when you don't have that, then find another way to get a person to feel more comfortable with, with communicating with you because the inability to communicate is extremely unnerving and frustrating. So you don't want to add that onto there. I, the list can go on, but there's, but it's really important. It boils down to this, never assume and always ask and continue to learn. I love that. And I'll just put a fine point on the, um, like standardizing the ask. Like we think about this all the time and how we honor identities. So we ask everyone about pronouns. We ask everyone about their chosen name. And that's because we can then say, if we ask everyone this, it's the standard thing we do to create power and choice. And uh, I think that's really true when we think about sort of how, how do we just always ask. And I think that also goes to say, like, you won't always get it right. And we're going to um, play a video here before we close out with just some final reminders and, and take some questions. We had a really great question about um, trauma within the criminal legal context that I'll tackle first. Um, but I just, uh, before I, I do play this video, I think one of the things that Lindsay has taught me, she's taught me so much as a leader, but is that you're not going to get it right every time. And the best thing you can do when you reflect and recognize that maybe you didn't get it exactly how you wanted to is you go back to the client and you say that, and you say, I reflected on how I reacted in this moment. Can you give me permission to try again? Like, just think about the amount of trust that is built by honoring and recognizing that we didn't get it exactly maybe the right way. Um, so let's uh, play a little video from my favorite researcher, Brene Brown, and this is just general communications and empathy considerations. And then we'll wrap up with uh, some questions. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. 
perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth, staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do, <laughs> recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, (laughs) it's bad, uh uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us, it's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. I love this video so much because I would, I would wager that most of us are in a helping profession because we like to solve hard problems. And what's really hard when you're trying to show up with people in their deepest, most tragic moments of their life, and you want to make it better, recognizing that there's nothing we can say or do to take away what they've experienced and just honoring and holding that is actually the most powerful thing we can do as a helper. And that's not what we've been taught, Right. Um, And so that to me is like changed the way I have hard conversations in my lives. It's changed the way I think about validating clients, even my own staff. And hopefully that's a helpful resource. We have about four minutes and I see a really great question um, here in the chat um, from Kelsey. And I know we had a prior uh, question. So I'll open up Google and Lindsay, if you want to jump in as well. One of the questions in the Q&A is how do we talk about, and it kind of ties into your your question too, Kelsey. And not only is the Brene Brown video helpful, there is some, there are some good resources on racial trauma and we can kind of circle back with some of those and and share them with Jennifer and and Anna to get those out to folks. Um, But remember that A trauma exposure is defined by the individual and not by an event. Um, It could be circumstances, it can be event, it can be a system that one is living within, um, like a racist and and a structure that's designed like the criminal legal system to be um, racist and oppressive, right? It can be just experiencing that system. And so it's really important for us when we talk about trauma within the, the sort of ecosystem of the legal system, we don't just talk about survivors who've experienced harm from violence. We we try to break down that binary of folks who have caused harm and people who've experienced harm. Because what we know in the research and the science, and we can share some of these articles too, is that unaddressed trauma causes trauma, right? We know in the research that someone who's experienced trauma is not necessarily likely to cause harm in the future, but they are likely to experience future harm or cause harm. And so um, I, I name that because I actually, I, when we when we think about what it means to, to be human, like shared suffering is a piece of that. And when that suffering is in the experience of trauma that is unaddressed, the consequences of that, the ripple effect is much bigger than just that individual, right? It's um, the the communities, the the larger systems. And so I want to be really clear that this trauma application and and the trauma responsive services, it applies whether you're working with a survivor of violence who's experienced trauma for crime. It also applies with a defendant who's experiencing a racist system as a person of color, right? Or or another marginalized identity. Um, 
And, and I think that ties in, Kelsey, to your question, you know, how do we talk about this? How do we normalize that there is racial trauma when we live in a, a structural system that was designed through white dominant culture and white supremacy? Um, there, there are some, some good resources that we can highlight for you all, but I think the key takeaway that I would want to highlight is that the person experiencing the harm defines whether or not it's traumatic, not us, not society, not the helper, right? It's the individual. And so to Lul's point, we ask, we ask, how have you experienced this? And then we sort of pivot and do the trauma responsive um, care and, and approach based on what the person shares with us has been their experience. Um, so hopefully that's a sort of catch all of how I would respond to those two really thoughtful questions that we could have a whole nother series about. Um, unfortunately for us, we're coming down to the end of our time. I want to honor again um, the time that you all have given to us today in the last 90 minutes. And I'll just give a final reminder to access the CLE materials today. Lindsay's going to put the link in there one more time. And be sure to please fill out that evaluation and the attorney affirmation forms. Um, those are available in the link that Lindsay's going to put into the chat box here. Thank you, Lindsay. You do want to email those forms to Jessica. Um, she went ahead and put Jessica's correct email in there. Again, remember the email that you got last night did not have the correct email for Jessica. So um, just want to make sure that, that folks have that. Um, and at this point, we're about to close out. I am so grateful that a lot of you got to stay till the end. I know you're busy. I know you're doing a lot. I want to honor and acknowledge um, the important work that you're doing in communities to support and address trauma and the ongoing consequences. Um, and so thank you for showing up today. I hope to see you all again for part two and even part three. Special thanks to Lul, uh, Lindsay, Anna, Jennifer, everyone behind the scenes, Jordan at HGS, Jessica, for making this um, come to life. We really appreciate your time and attention um, and wish everyone well. Thanks, Lul. I'll hang out in case anyone wants to, um, I'll, I'll stop the share here. If anyone wants to hang around and ask more questions, I'm happy to hang out for a couple of minutes. Oh, I get to just see you now. It's so nice. Thanks. Oh, Bridget, we didn't answer. I don't know if Judith is still here. Oh. Um, Liv, we didn't answer about the word gentleman. I'm sorry, I didn't hold you to oh, it. Oh, did she ask, uh, Judith asked yeah. about that. So we are going to cover that in part two. It's going to be around trauma-informed language and things not to say. I made one of the mistakes. I said a word that we actually tell people not to use when describing someone who's caused harm. Um, so Judith, if you left or if you're still here, um, we'll dive into sort of the language strategies and techniques and considerations in part two. Um, and so hopefully that will be helpful. Lindsay, that's also your thing. So you're probably like, ah, oh, Bridget, you did it. It, it is, I, but I forgot you asked me to hold you to it and I forgot. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, don't say it. Don't say gentlemen when you're describing somebody who <laughs> caused harm. Um, there's a reason we do that. Our society has conditioned us to do that. We'll talk about that. Thanks, Judith, for raising that. Um, awesome. Well, I'm not seeing any additional ones. Great feedback. Thank you for the feedback in the chat. Um, we look forward to being in community with you all again. Lul, you're the best. Appreciate your time and attention and all the work you do. And I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon. Of course. Thank you. It was really an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Liz. I'll talk to everyone hopefully soon and have a great rest of your day.